this is uh, me with a short follow-up or short or short normally these tends to get kind of long but it's a follow-up on the dumpster find pa6225 uh, pus computer that i had in my last video and i did omit some information that can be useful to understand what's really going on and as you can see here on my screen, I first go on to the, the Love Pin Count bus, the LPC bus that we was uh, speaking about earlier. And I actually found this uh, Wikipedia page after I did the last uh, video that in some, yeah, they come with some useful information that I did know, but I didn't find it important at the time. And this is really old technology. This is back in the Pentium. Um, yeah, it's uh, we, we, we're talking Pentium 2 uh, area here. And this was a time when Intel was trying to get rid of the ESA bus. And the ESA bus is a really expensive thing to implement because it has all these signal lines. And it also just communicated on 8 MHz. And the LPC bus is made as an alternative con to connect devices on the motherboard that should have ISA functionality, ISA address space, and so on, and that you needed for a PC back in the days. And that was things like the serial port, parallel ports, you had the floppy controller, you even though had some other means to connect other uh, peripherals as well to this uh, bus everything that was isa so also sound cards and other stuff could be connected to this bus and you also could of course have a bridge and connect an isa bus to this kind of bus and you can of course read a bit more in detail of this if you want and there are some in-depth information and some of this is linked from this article in uh, Wikipedia. Even though much of this is not useful on new mainboards, a lot of this technology is still used on some PCs. Like you have the PUS systems and other things that needs to be connected to serials or RS 482 buses. This can be really uh, useful stuff. And also when we have these kind of bugs, of course, vendors are trying to move away from this kind of, of connectivity. And in the, the NASAs and stuff that had this problem, this technology is really not needed as such. Of course, if you want to connect anything with serial bus and so on for SPI or something, okay, let's implement it. But otherwise, you really don't need it. And... In some modern model boards, you do have a lot of this functionality coupled to the PS uh, to the USB ports and USB hubs instead of the ISI bus. That is like things like PS2 keyboard functionality and other stuff. But this article can be a good read for uh, anyone that wants to yeah, have a more in-depth knowledge of what this is. It's, it's a really good explanation what this is. Although this clock 33.3 megahertz, uh, a lot of implementation has this as 25 megahertz. Here they also have some um, some graphics of how this is uh, connected, but of course this is not for uh, over implementation of this. But uh, as I said, a really really good read to get in depth knowledge of this. And now let's present some other stuff that was not in my previous video. I did take a scope picture of this um, of this signal and I will present it at here and as you can see the signal is about 2.6 volt but it's coupled almost all the way to the top of the signal and that means that the bottom part of the signal does not reach a low level and that's why i connected the resistor to ground and most of the faults that i have found that is not synology 
actually is supposed to put this to um, to ground and in some of the Synology and some of the QNAP I've seen they use a voltage divider to have the, the signal more in the middle of this but I, I really see no reason for this this signal obviously needs to be clamped to uh, to ground and I think that will do the least damage to the ship over time and now about some details that happened after the last video I was actually experiencing some instability with my fix and as I desoldered what I have done I, I saw here that what I have done is I've actually ripped off part of this uh, resistor here and this is where the signal goes into this um, to this ship over here and I was cleaning this um, this up and after the cleanup I saw that I actually ripped apart some of the or damped away or at least damaged some of the pad over here. So I actually measured out this uh, resistor here and this actually seems to be a zero ohm resistor. I'm not sure but that's what I managed to measure after I have mishandled it in, in this way. And um, this is how the trace uh, is going. So I just decided to use this solder pad over here instead. And I decided to solder this straight to the, the chip. And the way I handled this was that I actually soldered a wire over here, a wire over uh, at the chip. And um, as you can see here, this is the wire from the chip and this is the wire from the resistor. And both of these are connected to a resistor that finds its way to the ground connection. So um, that is how I managed to do this fixed. And this I did with wire wrap wire and not the, the thick solution where I soldered the resistor straight to this pad. I really ripped this pad straight off the, the resistor, it seems, with the weight of this, um, of this resistor legs. So this is the final fix that I did before I uh, put everything back together. As you probably saw from the last pictures, this is not something that I filmed with my ordinary camera. I used my El Shipu AliExpress microscope on this and this is actually quite good when you manage to keep it about level from um, the surface and it also has a light source that you have to adjust to not get the pictures overexposed. So this was what actually helped me to debug my soldering situation here. After soldering I just put on some pieces of electrical tape just to insulate uh, the resistor and the exposed legs of the resistor from being pushed down to the PCB when I have put the lid on. I don't think that will be a problem but anyway it's better to be on the safe side and insulate this. There will be no heat here so this will last forever. And I did remember to take care of most of the wires. This is the wire for the display, the digital connection for uh, the driving of the display. And this is the digitizer circuit for the display, the touch overlay. There was one more wire that I did forget at this time. And that will come back to bite me when I've started to get the lid back on. I forgot this um, for the card reader, but I won't bother to take this uh, out again because this card reader, I don't have any cards, I don't know how to use it, so that's not something I'm going to look into. Yeah, I think that was every one of those screws. And I have this one, of course, it was six screws, but I think it's more important just to connect it. It's just like so. 
Yeah, as I stated earlier, this case is built like a tank and the hard drive lid is no exception. Fasting this with six screws is way overkill. This is the bottom here. Some rubber things. Can't be bothered. Um, PGA. Power. It's booting American Megatrends on this one. It's booting Windows and it's preparing automatic repair. I don't. I will turn off every light here to uh, make you see this on, on the camera. I think. Yeah, it's a very reflective screen, but I do suppose this is possible to see. I can make it even better by turning off this, but then my camera will start flickering. I think. Diagnosing my PC. And this is giving picture both on my VGA and on the internal screen. It might be no, it's checking for the display or checking for this card reader. There's no way to be sure. Oh, and this one I have seen before. This PC was not started on a normal way. I can see the touch is working. And this is a Norwegian localized version of Windows. Of course, every message and every menu item is in Norwegian and not English. Yeah, I can connect a keyboard and try to get into the BIOS. But let's see if it starts. Remember, this is not a fast PC. It's just a Celeron with a J900, I'm not sure, but there it has uh, booted and surely it has been attached to some screen, some uh, keyboard, so that you can log into this, but I won't look into this um, any further. I will try to, um, to connect the keyboard and connecting um, this uh, display, this one here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just to see if, if things are, are working. This was connected to one of the comp ports. Maybe not that one. <laughs> Now it's lighting up, command, logistic control, VFD display, have a nice day, and thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do like it when my VFD displays are polite. I will try to find a USB keyboard and uh, connect that. And here I'm using the um, please subscribe marks just to hide the login information so that I don't reveal uh, what company dumped this away. I don't think they would like to have their name uh, written all over YouTube. So if you are able to, uh, uh, yeah, to make out the name, please don't spread it. I'm just going to start it anew and check if the display boots into something else. Otherwise, I won't bother anymore. I might reinstall this. This display is, is still very polite.
Oh, they can't access the network. Yeah, what's the worst that can happen? They can just plug it into my network and see what what happens. The worst thing that can happen is that I get ridden with a, a crypto locker or something. Oh, they can't connect me and I do think that's okay. I won't show any more of this. It's What's on this hard drive is not my uh, property in any way. So I will just stop this here. And But I, I will take uh, a look through this hard drive and see if there is some interesting stuff in here that can be drivers. Or maybe I can just download drivers from the net. I will check that. Yeah, I, I was watching my own take on this and I do think that I have not made myself clear enough on the different issues here. What I need to yeah, what I need to explain is that someone has sold this by a pull up and pull down resistor and some has sold this with a pull up resistor like in this case and we have actually sold this with just a pull down resistor as our signal was not reaching the low level. But as you can see, this is from uh, another YouTuber. And here you have a signal that you have to push up. It's not reaching the high level. This is only about 0 0.6 volt, 0 0.11 volt or something. And we need to have the, the signal go like this to be able to, uh, to reach the high level to trigger the input here. And that means that we actually have two sources of faults. And if you blindly just do this fix, you might be able to, to yeah, hit the right fault, even though you're not sure what you are doing, because this resistor is pulling down and this is pulling up. And this is uh, pulling up with 100 ohms and this with 470 ohms and both are probably good enough. And the reason that we have two different faults, you can see here, this is a totem pole. That is the normal output of um, a MUS circuit. And it consists of one P-channel and one N-channel CMOS. And what is apparently wrong here is that when you got the fault situation where you do a pull up, where the signal is not reaching high enough level, this top transistor, this P-channel, is gone, and you will do a pull-up here towards like this. And if you do have the fault here on the end channel, you will do a pull-down like this towards ground. So I do think both are right, but we need to know what we are doing here. And a signal that is not reaching the bottom you have to pull down, and the signal that's not reaching the top, you have to pull up. So hopefully this makes everything much clearer, and this is what I tried to explain in the beginning of the video. Otherwise, thanks for, uh, for watching. This was just a short follow-up to the dumpster find, so that you can see that it's, uh, it's still working. And hope you uh, liked uh, the contents. I will just put everything of this shortly back together again and put this in storage and see if we can do some other fun stuff with this other time. So again, thanks for watching and see you again in my next episode.